everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, just as usual, just give it a couple of minutes just to make sure everyone gets logged in okay. Uh, just a couple of minutes from now then. Just give it one more minute and then we'll get going. Yeah, perfect. I think we'll just get started now. So thank you, everyone. Welcome to our next webinar session in our core analysis and EOR series. Um, today we'll be looking at polymer EOR analysis requirements. My name is Jennifer Blundell. I'm the marketing manager here at Premier Codex, and I'm here with Jules Reed again today, who will be taking us through some of the various analyses necessary to correctly assess the feasibility of polymer EOR. I just have a quick look at the attendee list here. Um, I see some familiar names there. So I think a few of you might be familiar with our sessions already. Uh, I think this is our sixth core analysis and EOR session now. So we've been doing these in conjunction with our formation damage series as well, which um, I think a few of you may have also attended. Um, if you have joined us before, welcome back. We do appreciate your time and you being with us over the past few months. Um, and if you're new to joining, a big thank you and welcome to the session. Uh, I'll just run you through a few things quickly, just as usual, um, and then we'll get going. So we always like to mention we're very happy to take questions and queries as much as presenting and providing the content. It's important that you can get as much away from the session um, as you can. So yeah, just feel free to participate, ask questions throughout, and yeah, we we'll can, Jules will look to answer them as we run through. You'll see the Q&A function there in your control panel just at the bottom of the screen where you can do that. So yeah, please do, do use this Q&A um, rather than the chat function. It's just easier for Jules to see the questions pop up while he's speaking uh, through the Q&A. Uh, if you do have a question related to a specific slide as well, if you can just pop the number in there as well next to the questions, that can be useful to Jules. So we'll aim to last around 45 minutes today and then we'll have some time again for questions at the end as well. Um, so thank you everyone, that's all from me. I will talk you through a few things at the end as well, but I will pass you over to Jules now and he can get us started. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Hopefully you can all hear me this afternoon. Maybe Jennifer could just confirm that I, you can hear it. We had some technical issues this morning with my mic, which uh, didn't. Oh. We can hear you perfectly. Excellent. Thank goodness. <laughs> OK, so uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this session where we'll be looking not just at Polymer EOR. Uh, it, it, we're probably more going to touch on uh, chemical EOR, but what I'll I'll be looking at um, polymer, some some aspects of polymer uh, testing in particular uh, that will be necessary to be uh, performed. Um, so 
uh, for those of you who have not joined us before um, and are joining us for the first time, as uh, Jennifer said, my name is Jules Reed. I'm the uh, Global Technical Manager um, and this year is my 30th year in, in the industry. Um, I'm co-author of the, this uh, core analysis book, uh, Best Practice in Core Analysis, uh, where I can see one of my co-authors has uh, joined us um, as a participant today. So welcome, Itza. Um, and uh, I'm a former president of the Society of Core Analysts. And what, what I'll be uh, looking at um, as a very general uh, overview of what we'll uh, discuss I'll go through some of the general laboratory process controls and um, we'll look at um, historical assessment, you know, looking at basically what's happened before, asking that question before you begin using um, core material. Look at representative materials and I'll touch on what, what would we class as representative materials and then um, look at the experimental control and corrections that may be uh, necessary before we look at um, alkali surfactant and polymer chemical um, injection um, and the required data and analysis type that you, you may need. So if you've uh, joined us on any of our previous webinars you'll, you'll remember uh, that I started from coring um, touching on the core analysis uh, and the results that we obtain through core analysis can be impacted by processes that happen before most laboratories even get the core um, at, the, at the point of coring and, and how it's essential uh, that we understand what's happened to core before, that we do some due diligence on, on the core material that we obtain to make sure that the core is not damaged in any way and, and damage can come from various different sources and um, so these are some uh, CT scans and we would I would recommend performing CT scanning and imaging on your core before you use it um, so that you can see things like these the, these undesirable features that we're seeing here um, in this would come from gas expansion or from uh, drilling, um, mechanical damage through drilling, or from uh, damage because of, uh, of, of inappropriately handled core um, on these two bottom ones. So it's important to understand what's happened to the core before. So it's necessary to go back to um, coring, understand uh, what, what muds have been used, um, because through the coring, saturation may have changed, wettability may have changed, and there may have been an impact of on the geomechanics and the mechanical properties of the core as well. Um, so we, we want to go back and look at those data, ensure that, um, that the core we're using um, is representative. And that could mean um, that what we have to, have to do, rather than say doing a fresh state analysis, I've, I've reviewed a number of projects and studies where companies use the samples fresh state or as received and just plugged it into their equipment and ran with it. Um, and But saturation may have changed, wettability has changed. So it's not the same core as it was in the reservoir. And then you, you rather than doing a fresh state analysis, you would go through a cleaning, re-establishing wettability um, before uh, going into the testing. And um, if you've been with us through the previous webinars, you'll have understood that whole process of, of that, so from coring, through the core recovery, and through the well site handling, ensuring that the whole process has been um, done appropriately so that the core we're using in our experiments is good to use. And, and these were just a uh, um, humorous image of um, improperly preserved core. Um, so this is, uh, this is a core that we wouldn't recommend using. And for those of us who live in the north of Scotland, uh, we recognize this, um, or may recognize it as this, is a deep fried Mars bar, um, a local delicacy here. Um, the next thing that we want to do is make sure that our sample selection is relevant. So what makes representative core? Well, we want to make sure we cover a representative range of properties. 
because our reservoir is not one big um, um, big um, tank. Um, it's a collection of different lithologies, um, different rock types potentially, or hydraulic units, or however your petrophysicist is, is uh, describing your system. And what we want to do is also, in terms of the plugs themselves, so in this uh, picture here, what we can see um, is a, a, a range of different permeabilities. We have a permeability cutoff here at around about 10 uh, millidarcies. And, and so core samples have only been selected in those parts of the reservoir deemed um, appropriate for flow and uh, or that are going to be significant to flow. Um, but we've selected that, that range of samples across all the different properties um, that, are, that can be observed there. And the lines here are showing flow zone indicators uh, through those properties. Um, we, we then want to check that our samples are homogeneous. So we don't want samples that look like this. So again, we the, the um, doing CT analysis to check that we don't have undesirable features. Um, and if you've been with the previous webinars, you'll understand why we need homogeneous samples. Um, because many of the calculations, many of the analyses require that we have homogeneity. Um, the, 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 the interpretations or analysis are, are based upon that. And so quite often what we'd recommend is that if you're doing a study, always select at least um, say 20 to 40 percent additional samples than you think you will need. Because some of them will not be desirable for testing and you will uh, not use them. So uh, the other thing is to under, uh, ensure that you've got um, representative fluids. So representative core and representative fluids. Um, and within that there will be a decision of whether to use live crude oil, dead crude oil, or maybe even mineral oil. Um, you also want representative water saturation. So depending on your height above free water in the reservoir, ensuring that you've obtained core to the similar uh, representative water saturation so that you, uh, as you perform your uh, either a secondary water flood or tertiary um, uh, chemical injection, um, it's representative of the, the layer that you're interested in. Um, and we want to ensure that that water or formation brine, formation water, um, is as close to the reservoir water as possible. So we want to ensure we've got a full ionic compositional analysis of that. We also need a, um, knowledge of our mineral. So we want representative rock, representative fluids. And when we say representative, that may not mean the exact, um, the exact reservoir rock and reservoir fluid. It, it, it's something that represents, that will provide the same results um, as those um, fluids, but that requires knowledge of your reservoir, requires characterization of the reservoir and its fluids, and, and um, knowledge that, that the fluids you're using in, in the lab are basically going to give you the same results as the reservoir. But most often, that's going, particularly for chemical um, EOR, that's going to be live fluids and, and full reservoir conditions. So the temp uh, reservoir temperature and reservoir pressure. The other thing that we need to be careful of as well when we're performing these tests are capillary end effects. And I discussed this in our um, the last webinar where we we're looking at relative permeability. Because relative permeability is impacted by the uh, what, the boundary effects of these small samples that we're using. So this sample here on the right, or well on the left, um, is seven centimeters long. Um, and if we perform analyses at a certain rate, and if it's a fairly low rate, maybe equivalent to reservoir frontal uh, rates, uh, we might observe um, a saturation gradient like this because what we observe uh, or what the, the sample observes is a pressure gradient. So when we apply a pressure at one end of the sample, we obtain flow. But the pressure throughout the length of the sample is, is decreasing linearly if uh, we have a homogeneous sample. Um, 
and until at this uh, production end, we have nearly zero uh, differential pressures or displacement. Uh, and so there's little force moving uh, the fluid, the currently residing fluid, out of the sample. And so we build up this saturation gradient. And it's not a linear or average correlation between saturation and relative permeability. Um, so, so what we observe is we will see different relative permeabilities calculated by a standard analytical approach. If we did this at a low rate, we would see this type of uh, rel perm curve. If we did it at a higher rate, we would get a different rel perm curve and a higher rate still, maybe a, a different one. But none of them have quite captured uh, the, the real relative permeability. And if that's happening when we're, when we're trying to uh, determine EOR, that's going to potentially have significant impact on our, um, on our decision making process for um, investment in EOR because we're now considering much higher investments um, to put EOR into practice and the cost of injection of EOR processes is much greater than um, primary and secondary production. process model training becomes much smaller and this is just um, taking those data and showing you the type, of, the type of impact it may have on production rate so if we were up to obtain a relative permeability like this this would be the production um, oil production curve over time um, whereas if we were to perform it at higher rates uh, we get more production curves that look more like this Obviously, that's going to have a larger impact if we had performed at this and didn't uh, correct for the data, uh, then we would be say, well, we've got a long way, um, a significant amount of potential EOR, um, and so it might be um, desirable to go for EOR. If we were to get a, a data like this, it, it, what we might calculate is, well, there's actually relatively little additional from EO, that EOR can give. And so it becomes very important in that EOR decision process. And so what we would recommend is simulation of data uh, to simulate the relative permeability curves, um, get the correct rel perm data and correct for these capillary end effects. And that's going to be necessary when we look at the um, EOR potential as well. But from the EOR core floods, um, it's going to be necessary to uh, correct for these uh, boundary impact. And, and so there are method sensitivities. Uh, the, um, we looked at this last time as well. Steady state doesn't quite reach residual oil and neither does unsteady state. Um, unsteady state is probably going to be the, the method used for most EOR processes because it's the method that most closely resembles what's going to happen in your reservoir terms of the displacement process with a uh, Buckley Leverett flood front um, pushing uh, an oil bank ahead of um, a water phase or an injection phase. It won't reach residual um, and that can have a big impact. This uh, uh, understanding residual oil saturation and that's maybe a, 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 um, a webinar that we're considering putting on um, in a uh, not next time, but the time after. Um, and this is some data from Jos Mass, who was former head of uh, Shell Research, um, from some um, training back in 2013, um, basically uh, indicating that um, around uh, many areas around the world, we're overestimating the residual oil uh, uh, in, in our reservoirs. And, and the, our residuals may be actually significantly lower than we think they are. And that has a big impact on the decision of EOR. And, and how does it, that impact it in our tests? Well, if we've got these capillary end effects and the boundary effects, which are causing this um, uncertainty in residual oil, then what we may be observing in our test is merely the removal of the boundary where in this particular case, um, that would be an additional 11% if you were to do that by, by just 
um, un not really knowing what's happening inside the core, um, not understanding the capillary boundary effects and calculating the change from here to here is 11% of, of the pore volume um, or 11% of the original oil in place. And that could be a significant uh, or enough to say, yes, we'll go ahead with this EOR process. But here is what's representative of our reservoir or more representative of the reservoir. Your reservoir is not going to observe these boundary effects because we have so much, this, we have far more than seven or eight centimeters. Our reservoir is off the scale, um, off to the other end of the, the um, graph here, um, and magnitudes gr greater length than we see here. And so we're gonna be somewhere much closer to this, which is 3% um, enhancement, which could mean, well, it's not, good enough to go for EOR. And so you may decide, well, I'm not going to put that investment in. So it's, it's extremely important to understand initially, what is my base case of scenario? What am I actually going to be um, uh, measuring? It's also important to understand and ensure that the core floods that we perform are, are not observing uh, these boundary effects or we're correcting for them either by simulation or ensuring that we have long core samples which then requires real rigorous characterization of those samples to make sure that the samples we place into our, um, our system and stack together are really all the same sample and are, and are connected together. So looking at the process itself um, so we're, we're considering polymer injection and it's often performed as part of a, um, a, a chemical injection process. So, so rarely these days is polymer alone injecting. Um, you would normally combine it with maybe a surfactant polymer or an alkali surfactant polymer. Um, and um, ahead of the alkali surfactant, um, this is just showing you from the injector, um, you've got um, the oil bank here, and um, this is showing an alkali surfactant polymer, a head of a polymer, um, and then followed up by a water injection. You may also have a, a water um, bank before the um, alkali surfactant, um, because it depends on your, your reservoir, depends on what your development plans are, depends what you've already been doing. So if you're only going by depletion, um, then you may just go in with a, um, an ASP. Um, if you have uh, already been water flooding, then you want to look at the impact of water flooding ahead of your um, ASP polymer. Um, uh, or if you've got a high salinity reservoir, um, you may be wanting to do a low salinity water before you do your, your um, ASP and polymer. And we'll come on to look at why that may be. Um, but if, you've, if you're then doing a, a water flood, a low salinity water flood, there may be EOR impact from the low salinity. Uh, and so then you have to make, take the decision, well, what is the impact, is there impact of EOR just purely from the low uh, salinity injection as well before I do my polymer? So all of these things, um, the, the planned process needs to be thought through um, and, and the testing designed against those plans. So what are we actually trying to do when we, when we do a, a chemical um, injection process for EOR? Well, these are the very, very basic um, fundamental reserve calculations. So that my production volume is equal to my hydrocarbons in place times this here, my recovery efficiency. And that recovery efficiency is a function of maybe four major um, other portions that, that come into that. Um, part of that is the macroscopic sweep efficiency, which is the volumetric um, aerial and vertical sweep, how my, um, which comes from characterization of reservoir and how the fluid passes through the different layers of, my, of the reservoir. Um, it was, there's also a connected sweep efficiency in, in here, which comes from um, maybe seismics and geology of understanding compartmentalization, um, fracture networks within my reservoir, etc. 
Um, and then there's an economic efficiency, which is really purely decided by how much is it costing me to inject? How much am I getting back in production? Um, and how much is it costing to produce? Um, and having some, some point of um, cut off of when it becomes uneconomical to continue. What we're doing in the laboratory though is this portion, microscopic sweep efficiency. So we're looking at, at what the sweep is in, in a homogenous layer of the reservoir, which is why it's important to really understand um, for, in, for the macroscopic sweep, the different layering that's happen, happening and whether those different layers have uh, different um, flow um, properties. Um, and, and we would be looking at, um, at this process, maybe from relative permeability before, how that um, impacts on the different layers. Um, but what we're looking at in the lab is this, the, the flow through those individual layers, which is why we need these homogeneous samples. And, and, and how do we um, observe any incremental? Well, what we'll see is from a production rate, uh, oil production rate will be that we've uh, based on some base case scenario. So understanding our relative permeability and our original water injection process is important to understand what our um, projected profile, production profile will be. And any increase on that is the enhanced oil recovery or incremental oil recovery from our chemical injection. And over time, we can calculate this volume and that, that makes the decision of whether it's a, a valid approach or not. And what we're attempting to do, there are two, really two main things that we're doing in EOR. We're either um, looking to um, improve mobility or sweep efficiency by reducing this mobility ratio, or we're attempting to improve residual oil saturation, um, or a mix of the both, depending on the process that we're using. And, and these, this is a, a list of the a type of testing that you will need to perform for that. Now, this is not an exhaustive list um, because uh, many of these uh, analyses will be dependent on your reservoir, on your reservoir properties, on the characterization that you've performed um, and, and your planned process. Um, but these are some uh, uh, largely generic um, issues and uh, testing that you will require. Characterization, so understanding your reservoir, understanding the mineralogy and the pore throw size distribution, so which, which is going to be important for microscopic sweep. So understanding your mineralogy, because this is a chemical process. And we're injecting chemicals into a system that has chemistry um, and there will be interaction. And we need to understand what that interaction may be. We need to understand the wettability as we will um, come on to see, particularly alkali or so, and surfactant can alter the wettability. Imbibition capillary pressure, with and without the chemicals, to understand the change in capillary pressure as we inject, and that uh, helps understand the boundary effects that we are, we're going to be observing. Um, our relative permeability. Um, so we need this secondary injection. If it's not already been obtained, we need to understand what that base case scenario is so we know what additional um, recovery is going to be. And then you want to, then you'll be looking at the actual um, chemical flooding itself, either as a tertiary process after a secondary um, water flood, or as a, as, as a secondary process, potentially, if you're, if you're going to produce from primary um, depletion directly into a chemical injection. You want to do chemical analysis of the effluent composition as well, to, uh, to know, understand the chemistry of what you're injecting and the chemistry of what's coming out and um, to look at any changes that are occurring between those and understand how the chemistry is interacting with the, the, the sample in place. And then very important is formation damage. Um, this is probably, um, is maybe forgotten by many EOR processes because we want to think, we're thinking, oh, what's the, the impact of enhanced oil recovery? These chemicals we're injecting 
have a potential detrimental impact as well, which we'll, we'll um, continue to talk about through the remainder of this session. So wettability, um, over the past uh, webinars, we've looked at how wettability can be changed either from the different pr um, process, whether we're drainage or imbibition, or from the chemicals that we're injecting. And wettability alters then relative permeability. So how um, this, the fluids occupy the space and flow through the pore space is, is a function of wettability. So understanding what's happening there is, is important in the process. And understanding capillary pressure is important, particularly if we're, in, we're, we're injecting surfactants. The, the reduction of interfacial tension or surface tension between the fluids, um, we reduce the surface tension, that reduces the, um, how those uh, fluids interact with each other and how they interact with the surface, um, which uh, then changes capillary pressure and is the change to uh, wettability. And then um, understanding the formation damage or the potential formation damage, particularly for alkali. So ahead of, um, no, ahead of some polymer studies, um, you will have this alkali and surfactant, or it may be as part of a whole, an alkali surfactant polymer mix. But the alkali um, that's being injected could be damaging to your core or to the reservoir. And you need to know uh, the impact of that. All those chemicals interact with the chemistry of, of the water phase and may cause scaling. Um, and then you, you may need to use scale inhibitors. If, if, you, if you have scaling in your um, injectors um, and begin to shut off injection and, and uh, deplete your injectivity, then you need to um, analyze the impact of that. And so quite almost hand in hand, together with the actual EOR process, you want to look at the impact of those uh, of the chemistry on other um, properties of the core, of the core mineralogy for say clay sensitivity, if you're gonna get fines migration, um, potential for dissolution, um, and, and then a large scale, um, that could impact the, uh, the rock strength. And so you could have, uh, well bore stability issues. So all of these things really need to be studied, not just whether it enhances production, but its, its overall impact on the, the reservoir as whole. And one of the things that our um, company have been doing in formation damage as well is looking at um, using micro CT imaging to look at what's actually happening inside the pore space um, to and uh, put, pulling out the changes that are occurring there so that we can do um, modeling um, of, of that process and its impact on the reservoir. So what about the, the um, polymer and surfactant process or a ASP process itself? Well, what the polymer is doing in terms of those two EOR processes in general, the biggest impact is reducing this mobility ratio, M. So by increasing the viscosity of the water phase, we decrease um, M, which improves our sweep efficiency. Um, we get um, better, I think uh, it was a few slides uh, earlier, we think with better sweep efficiency, you get later breakthrough um, and, and a higher overall um, production. So that's the largest or biggest impact. Now, the, the, some polymers, uh, some of the components of the polymer may interact with the reservoir. You may get absorption of some parts of the polymer on surfaces. That can also change then um, residual oil saturation potentially, um, but it, it's often more of a minor, um, it, uh, a minor impact. The major impact is reducing and improving, reducing M, improving sweep efficiency. Whilst it, the surfactant, its major process is, is reducing surface tensions and reducing the, our um, residual oil saturation. And surfactant, it could have many different names, uh, micellar polymer, micellar, uh, micro emulsion, etc. 
Um, and what we're doing with surfactant is we would start off with, say, a water phase and an oil phase, and, and these are immiscible or mostly immiscible. But, but with, by the introduction of surfactant, uh, we be, begin to break down the miscibility. And as a fact, and we use it every day, soap, and we wash our hands, uh, particularly at the moment. We've all been washing our hands a lot recently, maybe more than normal. Um, and and as we, we're using surfactant to break down the barrier between water and, and oil or dirt and to, to wash these things away. And, and if we get the optimal amount, what we can get is a single phase of microemulsion of, of, of a surfactant uh, water oil phase um, and uh, this is just showing you a surfactant um, it, it has a polar head and a non-polar tail where the polar head sits in the water the non-polar tail would sit in um, in oil and they congregate together into these micelles so this is a micelle this would be an oil in water um, uh, emulsion this would be here would be how they sit in a water in oil emulsion um, but they, they form complexes, uh, different shapes. So you may get more complex shapes uh, rather than just a sphere of um, molecules. It could become uh, linear uh, um, and, or laminar um, in the pore space. Uh, but what we're looking for, the test that you want to do is, is this Windsor typing, um, where we're, we're bringing water, oil, and sphactant together in, in a, a test tube or a bottle test to look at how they interact together. And what we're looking for is this, what's called Windsor type three, um, where we've got water in oil and oil in water together in the same, um, um, uh, same uh, single phase um, between an oil and a water phase. And well, we can do that with the crude oil as well. So this was with the mineral oil and some water phase. This is with the crude oil. And we're looking for this um, uh, micellar or Windsor type three micro emulsion between. And what we want to find is the, the surfactant concentration that gives us the largest my, um, micro emulsion volume. And that's going to be the one that's most appropriate. That we, we can calculate then this so oil and water solubility ratio. So how much of the oil is dissolved into that middle portion, how much of the water, um, and, and find the optimal point there. That's going to, as I said, going to be a function of concentration of the surfactant, uh, of, con of salinity of, my, of the water, and the composition of the oil. Um, so it's quite a complex thing. And you then uh, will, may want to also look at what's the impact of only the surfactant um, and, and its impact on, on um, production. But moving into the polymers, um, there are probably two major polymer types that are used in the industry um, in EOR process. One would be polysaccharides and the other is polyacrylamide. Um, and, uh, and xanthan gum um, is an example of, of a polysaccharide. It would look something like this. So it's chains of hydrocarbons. Um, these are cyclic hydrocarbons, um, not benzene, but uh, cyclohexanes um, to, together. A polyacrylamide has uh, this, these um, nitro or amide uh, portions, so nitrogen and oxygen bearing. Um, and this is this portion that might be absorbed onto certain mineral surfaces, uh, which is why you need to um, um, account for that in your um, testing. So when the testing on the polymers themselves, what we'd be looking to do is um, bulk rheology. Uh, you want to look at in situ rheology um, and the filtration ratio. Um, what, we're, what we're doing basically in this bulk rheology, we're looking at the impact of, on, of um, the water properties, the temperature um, on the properties of the polymer. So we, uh, we bring the polymer, to hydrolyze the polymer, bring it into solution, into the water. We want to check that that is a homogeneous um, hydrolysis, uh, hydrolysis process uh, so that you don't get a mix of 
of some strands like this in some areas and some which is globular like this in other areas. It wants to be uh, homogenous of very similar um, polymer shapes. Um, so this would be uh, as it hydrolyzes and, and you'll get different shapes based on the salinity. Um, because um, if it, it if, depending on the salinity, the polymer will want to curl in on itself and stick to itself, or it will want to stretch out in, and um, and hydrolyze in, and uh, in the in the water. Um, but you want to test that by this filtration ratio. So you filter the the, the polymer, um, and you check um, the rate that it takes to uh, between um, 60 cc and 80 cc of the of the polymer and between 180 and 200 cc's of the polymer and they should be basically equal. So you want a filtration rate roughly equal to one a linear um, line like these uh, here. You also want to then uh, look at polymer versus its concentration, the amount of polymer in solution in that water um, because you different concentrations you will get a, a different viscosity and it's not um, a linear viscosity. So these are non-Newtonian fluids and you want to not just measure viscosity um, just going through say the standard um, Ublehold tube, you want to look at it as a function of shear. So as we place a shear force on the sample, what happens to the molecules is some of them will be stretched out. So rather than taking this globular form, uh, they'll begin to be stretched into more chain-like um, uh, fluid and, and we, then the viscosity will be lower as they become more chain-like rather than this globular form. And, and so these uh, rheology of, of, of polymers are a function of shear and of the concentration of polymer, of the concentration of my salinity. And you want to test all of these things. Um, then once you've obtained your bulk rheology of, uh, of um, how it impact, how the polymer is impacted by shear, you then want to look at it in, in uh, injection into your sample. And you need to then convert your sample flow rates into a, a shear um, and compare uh, the shear that we're seeing, so the shear thinning that we're seeing in bulk rheology but what we observe here is there's, um, there's correlation uh, at this 2000 ppm. So there's initial correlation, but then it begins to go through what's called shear thickening. Um, and, and, and this is quite, uh, particularly with um, polyacrylamides, this is quite often observed that, that, that it observed the shear thinning as expected but then a shear thickening portion as shear rate inside the pore space increases, which is not observed in the bulk rheology. And understanding where that happens is important because we, we, this is how we're going to determine our apparent viscosity and calculate things like permeability in the system. Once we've done all the testing on the samples themselves or on the fluids uh, themselves, and we, we, we know we've got um, a good, a representative core, that we've got good representative um, polymer and, and surfactant system, then we can begin to look at how it impacts production in our core sample, in the core fluid. Um, and this is just an example showing you uh, in here, there's a, um, a secondary water injection and then a, a, a surfactant polymer portion followed by more water. Um, and these have been done at, um, at, at different initial water volumes. Um, so taking the water portion to completion before uh, injecting the chemical um, or a, a more limited uh, set of data before the uh, chemical. And uh, we're seeing quite a similar um, a enhanced oil recovery um, independent of where those, in this particular case, independent of when you apply it. Um, but we can see this significant impact here. Um, uh, these, these tests, we, you can uh, begin to look at what the impact of altering, say, surfactant concentration, polymer concentration is overall on this, um, on the additional recovery.
and that's going to be important. And one of the things to really pay attention to is um, the con controlling this tertiary flood and control it by constant differential pressure. So we're not changing the, the force across the sample. Um, we're, because the, that displacement force across the sample um, could, if we change the displacement force by um, injecting at the same rate with a polymer, our, our differential pressure will increase. And that will, that will potentially decrease my end effect. So what we could be measuring if we do it by rate is merely an end effect reduction. Um, so we need to be careful how those tests are performed. So thank you for your attention. Just as a quick conclusion, um, when we're performing these tests, the first thing we want to do is make sure we've got appropriate control of the process from coring through all the way through to the point where we begin the test. We want to ensure that we've got representative core material and representative fluids. Um, whether, whether or not they're the real reservoir core, real reservoir fluids that they representative um, and, and are giving real, realistic results. We want to ensure that testing is going to be performed under representative conditions. So wh whatever is going to be representative of the reservoir. Um, and appropriate wettability is essential. Without appropriate wettability, uh, we won't get good data. You need to understand your mineralogy, that needs to be characterized. You need to look at formation damage impact, particularly with alkalis, um, and, uh, which have a, a larger potential impact on damaging effects. Um, we want to look at relative permeability to ensure we understand what our base case is so that we know how much um, we're improving on that base case. Then, uh, then we want to do a water flood and it, we recommend simulating those data to ensure that you're backing out any potential boundary effects. And lastly, you want to ensure that you've got um, control of the chemistry by measuring the effluent composition. So we know the composition of what we're injecting, but we want to know what, we're, uh, what is being produced so that we know what's happening inside. So thank you for your attention, and we'll begin to take any questions that people may have. You all understood it perfectly. No questions. There was one from this morning, uh, or one by we received by email. Uh, Jennifer, could you remind me of that one? Yeah, I was just wanted to mention, Jill. So this question: How can we utilize the lab measurements to develop reservoir simulation inputs? Is there a workflow to compare the lab observation against a field pilot? Um, trying to understand how to scale up the measurements at a plug level to observations at a field level. And, and um, uh, that, that is one uh, that is a, um, a difficult one. Uh, so the, we touched on this in the relative permeability. So one, one of the things we're, we're looking at, right at the start I said that we're, we're uh, doing um, microscopic sweep efficiency. That's what these tests are, are um, designed to do. They're designed to consider microscopic sweep efficiency. And uh, that is a homogeneous layer, but your reservoir is, is not one homogeneous layer of, of rock. You, you will have varying um, um, heterogeneous layers of different permeabilities or different porosity uh, and understanding that variance is, is important to upscaling uh, the system. One of the, one of the um, images I showed in the relative permeability webinar was um, of a paper from Hamon uh, showing the impact of heterogeneity that uh, from, from a, um, um, a Cori style relative permeability uh, which is a, a, a good exponential curve. Um, by introducing heterogeneities, we begin to move away from uh, that uh, single exponential. 
and we begin to get um, sigmoid shaped curvature. So it's important to understand uh, the heterogeneities. It's important to understand the different layers. It's important to understand the relative permeability through those layers. Um, and, and I think um, what I touched on in, in that uh, relative permeability webinar was how with the advent, the, the way that the industry used to do this was it with fairly uh, simple equations um, and on a layered system. Uh, and understanding the flow through layers and how those that the sweep would go through through layers, um, what we've begun, what we've come to is a block model system in simulators where that block has averaged out um, all the, the the many layers. So the first thing you want to do is go to fine scale layer um, a fine scale layered system um, to understand the impact of flow through the layers. Um, <clears throat> with a permeability. Now permeability, or, sorry, relative permeability, um, it, I've looked at many of these data and uh, you, you, you often can find some correlation to reservoir, other rep reservoir properties. So that you, rather than being a single tabular input, um, it really ought to be um, a modular input or a matrix input based on the properties of, of the cell that it's going into. Um, and, and so then um, you can build up uh, the production from that process and, and look at production and convert that production into a, a heterogeneous relative permeability. Um, it's, I think it's a complex, or, or you have to go through some pseudoization process, um, which is, I think is what many reservoir engineers tend to hunt for because it's easier and quicker. Whether it's better is a different question. It gives you ac um, more accurate data is, is, is obviously a different question as well. Um, but upscaling is an issue, or potential issue, and one that needs to be resolved. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, another question here. Can you elaborate on the effect of um, iron on polymer and, and recovery of oil? Thanks. So uh, the, the impact of iron, it depends where the iron is um, and what form it's, it, it takes. So iron, um, iron rich minerals tend to be quite oil wetting um, on, on the whole. Um, so uh, the, Im the impact of iron um, in terms of a mineralogy, if it's present in the uh, reservoir, um, may promote non-water wetness um, and, and so um, surfactants may be uh, useful there or alkali um, to change the wettability uh, generally by increasing the pH. Uh, we see this from low salinity injection, increasing a in the pH um, it moves uh, towards water wetness um, and improves uh, sweep uh, because oil wetness, oil wet or less water wet cores um, have a gen generally have a poorer sweep efficiency or um, mobility um, so the minerals themselves have that potential impact if the iron is coming from the pipe work um, and and um, is in the water phase because of uh, disintegrating um, equipment then that can have an impact basically on, on reducing um, solubilities of the different chemicals. Um, and so they become potentially less effective. Um, so if you reduce the solubility of those chemicals, that's going to be a reduced um, recovery. And if there are... Uh, and no more questions. I'll hand back to Jennifer, who will finish off with some announcements. And thank you again for all your attention. Great, thank you, Jules. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, yeah, if you do have any additional questions, just feel free to get in touch with us. My email address is dropped off slightly there, but um, it's yeah, just similar to can, Jules. I can fix that. Just similar to Jules, jennifer.blundell at pufg.com. 
Um, if, and if you've missed any of our sessions, just contact me if you'd like to see these um, and I can pass you the details. There are some of our previous webinars on our Premier Corex and Premier Oilfield Group YouTube channel as well, so you can uh, go on there and have a look. You'll see we've got a great session scheduled coming up. If Jules, you could go to the next uh, slide maybe. Um, on the 17th of September, Justin Green is back for the Formation Damage series. He's looking at high resolution scanning this time. This one's actually a bit of a follow on from Justin's last webinar on visualization of formation damage. So if you are were at that one, you won't want to miss next week's one. So details will be released on our LinkedIn page later today. So you'll be able to register on there shortly. Um, while you're on LinkedIn, if you haven't already, perhaps you could give us a quick follow. We really appreciate the support. And of course, it will also um, help keep you updated on our future news and events coming soon. You'll see as well, Jules is back on Thursday, the 1st of October with capillary pressure methods, QC and interpretation. Um, and he'll give us an insight into the main laboratory methods used to determine core-based capillary pressure, how to quality control and interpret results. We always like to mention as well, um, we do this every session, but if you do have any ideas for specific topics you would like to see from us going forward, just let us know. Um, we're also hosting a lot of company specific and focused webinars, Q and A's and technical sessions at the moment, which is great as we can really tailor sessions and content to the individual teams and company requirements. Um, I think that is all for today. Um, we had a couple of other questions come through, Jules. I'm not sure if you maybe want to jump on them quickly or we can get back by. Yes, I, I saw that. I pressed the wrong. I was going to uh, answer by typing, but I pressed the wrong button, so I can answer <laughs> one. Um, uh, the um, the polymer thickening. So um, Ahmed asks, can polymer thickening behavior uh, take place deep in the reservoir? And, um, <clears throat> generally, polymer thickening is going to uh, happen in the near well bore region, um, where you have high velocity. So in the reservoir, as you increase velocity, you get um, increased shear effects. And, and through the pore space, if you're going through a tighter pore space, um, it will increase the velo local velocity, which increases the shear. So as, you, as the um, polymer injects into the reservoir, you, there is significant increase in the shear rate, um, which uh, potentially has, um, can um, go into polymer thickening. But as you get deeper into the reservoir um, into the, and, and the polymer becomes the frontal uh, rate, most reservoir frontal rates calculate to something like somewhere between one and 10 per second shear. So a, a, a relatively low shear um, and, and somewhere along the shear thinning line for most systems. Um, the other question was um, what, from Jorge or George, not sure how to pronounce your names. I'm sorry if I pronounced it incorrectly. Um, what is the required uh, value of microemulsion height in the tubes? Um, <clears throat> does it depend on surfactant type or is there any reference value? <clears throat> and it really depends on, um, on the, your water on the salinity of the water and composition. Uh, so um, multivalent ions like calcium, magnesium have a different impact than uh, monovalent ions like sodium and potassium. Um, so the composition of the water is important. Also the composition of the oil um, and it may have natural surfactants. So most oils have some uh, potential uh, natural surfactants. Um, so it, it's usually uh, um, a variety of tests and, and many um, chemical companies may run hundreds or thousands of these uh, test tubes, uh, tests, uh, to find uh, the most optimal um, system, the most optimal surfactant uh, type and surfactant uh, um, concentration uh, that gives you the, the largest um, of that microemulsion. 
And what, what the best, of course, will be if that is if all fluids in that test tube are converted into that um, type three ones. Okay, um, I think that's everything there. Um, yeah, any other questions we'll get back to by email. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. It's always great to have you with us and we hope you can join us for the next sessions. Thanks everyone.